This is Service Storefront. Latinos make up 20% of the population, yet publishing is only 8% Latino, making it the worst field in media for representation, according to Publishers Weekly. There's so much untapped talent in this underrepresented demographic, yet Latinos are always seen as less than. So Davina, the founder of Alegria Publishing, wanted to focus on supporting new, exciting, and emerging literary voices in the Latinx community. Today we talk with Divina about her journey from growing up in Colombia during Pablo Escobar's reign to starting a luxury magazine in Los Angeles, how art truly has the power to change lives, and why it was a blessing to start the magazine prior to the rise of social media. All right, welcome to the podcast. On today's show, we're talking to Divina from Alegria Publishing. Thanks for coming. For people who don't know, what is what is Alegria? We're a multimedia company specializing in bringing out the best Latin, Latinx talent to the forefront because as we know, we're highly underrepresented and we're just in the millions in the U.S. You know, we're part of this beautiful country and there's so much talent out there and we want to bring out their art, their books, and their voices to the forefront. What what made you want to first start the company? What was the idea? Were you a creator yourself? Were you a writer? Your, what was the thing where you were like, okay, I need to, we need, it's bigger than me now. We need to start a whole publishing company to help other people. Yes. Actually, I grew up in Colombia, managed in Colombia in the 90s, in the time of Pablo Escobar. So it was a war zone at the time. And I took refuge in literature and creative writing. And the arts, quite, I always say, the arts saved my life. And... I always grew up with that, but when I came to the U.S. in like the 1997, to be as exact, you know, the arts in the U.S. are actually value, which, you know, here, especially, you know, in Los Angeles, we have a lot of big creatives. And I saw that the arts were like actually careers, right? In Latin America at that time, it was very tough, right? That's true, yeah. And yet, when I started studying here in college, you know, I went to theater school first and then journalism school. I saw that everything that was out there, we're talking about like 12 years ago, about Latinos and Latinas in the U.S. was always seen as less than. It was always produced in bad quality formats, especially because I started with print. I'm a big believer in print, even today. And everything was like just the the dialogue about who we were here, yeah. having been brought up in South America, which is very beautiful and sophisticated. And, and I said, it, it's just not correct, the dialogue here about uh, Latinos and who we are and our why culture. Do you think, why do you think that is when you think about that? Why do you think the story gets so so muddled here? Because we have, of course, a lot of people that come because of very difficult circumstances, right? Looking for a better future. So, of course, naturally, when we come here, we, we come and do the jobs that no one wants to do, right? So that's the perception that when we're in the U.S., you know, we're used to seeing the person that is serving us or, you know, the dishwasher. We think those are the only Latinos out there, which, by the way, these are the most hardworking and beautiful people, right? No one cares about their stories, and their stories are, like, wonderful. But there are Latinos doing wonderful things in the U.S. And I wanted to concentrate on the positive contributions of our community here, which was nowhere to be found. And then the media does a really good job of pushing forward those stereotypes Absolutely. of like, oh, you're Latin, you must be a dishwasher. And then you see it everywhere in the movies. A hundred percent. And it happens to African-Americans also. Same thing. Yeah. Do you remember in your childhood, if there was like a first impression of the arts or a first introduction that opened your eyes to what it could do, how it could transform your life, how you could get involved with it. Was it a community aspect down there? Like, do you remember if there was a, a singular moment? Yes, I think in school, you know, when they come and bring these artists, I remember there was this beautiful theater show that they brought to our school and I was just really mesmerized by it, especially because, you know, when you're living in a place where your reality is you're having lunch with your family and a car bomb is exploding <laughs> like weekly. You know, anything that just takes you out of that, right? And I think the arts always was that place where like... It was like an escape. hundred percent. And, and it was a healthy way too, you know, where I could do something productive with our, my time. And, and I think even today, it continues to like bring this beauty and like quite honestly, this aspect of healing to my life. Because as we know, mental health is a big issue right now. And I love like encouraging people to take up the art to help them to navigate life as well. So it's a theme that has been going through uh, my life for and, sure. And what was sort of the first step in starting your company, the publishing company? 
So it actually started with a magazine in 2012, and it was like a wonderful combination of beautiful elements. I've obviously worked so hard for so many years, went to college, had two jobs, took the bus in Los Angeles for like 12 years, and I worked as a receptionist in Beverly Hills for many years as I was going to college. And one of the clients that, you know, there were like regular clients that we took care of every, you know, weekly that came to do their hair was this beautiful lady, and I love mentioning her name because she's my mentor and she changed my life. Her name is Rochelle Newman. She knew what I was doing at the time, and at the time I was interning, doing a lot of like celebrity interviews, uh, working in like Spanish television, you know, very small channels and stuff like that. And, and she always knew that I had this in me to to change how people view Latinos. And I told her I was working on this crazy idea to create a bilingual luxury magazine. And she's like, show it to me. And I didn't know she was like the head of marketing for Lexus USA at the time. And she ended up like a month later having this meeting with like the whole team and they're actually launched my publication with wow. like a five-year contract wow so that literally changed my life yeah. because yeah. i was yeah. a receptionist you know and i think this is something i love to inspire people with this i don't know if it's a piece of advice but something that is a truth about my life that even when i had my regular job to pay my bills i never stopped working on my art or my projects on the side so even when i was a receptionist i was of course very tired and unmotivated at the end of the day but i would like work on my creative projects after my job you know and and that way you know that moment came you know and i already had everything i had a i had my f- designer friends who had like a mock up right. i have right. the con- so right. when that came, I was ready. And how, yeah. how long did you talk to her about the idea? Like, was it every time you guys saw each other, she, you would just say a little bit more than like, oh, we're doing this. And then here's the mock up. Yes. I will even run into like events where like she'll see me like a covering a red carpet or something like that. So she knew me. We got to know each other a little bit. And and of course, to this day, I talked to her. She's still my mentor. And I said, wow, like I could have really come out with like some really crappy product and you really believed in me. So, you know, sometimes it's so beautiful that people do see in us things that sometimes maybe we don't even aware of. And and she took that big, That's why I'm I'm just such a believer in like, um, I think think the, the hard part about entrepreneurship or even what you're talking about, even being a creative, is I think sometimes people, they just, they forget that what's of value is the idea. What people really get behind is the idea. And a lot of people get stuck on like, oh, I don't have the money. They, and, and they lose all faith and they just start really focusing on the money or, oh, but nobody knows me or, oh, I don't have the connections. And all of that is just so toxic. It's like, just go back to the idea. Go back, 100%. put all your energy into just how do I move this one step forward at a time? And then eventually something great can happen. Absolutely. And I also believe that to my advantage, we know social media and technology is great in so many ways, but at that time, you know, we didn't have like what we have now. And and that was a blessing sometimes because I feel like today for young entrepreneurs, we have so much information that unless you have (laughs) the venture capitalist that's giving you all this money, then your idea is worth nothing. And I had nothing, guys. When I said nothing, I was just I was a receptionist sure. that took mm-hmm. the bus and I was just extremely creative. I've, and of course, I've been studying for many years and I was very dedicated, but I had no contracts, no rich family, nothing, you know, yeah. so it is possible. But, but you have the desire. Ex- hundred, yeah. And you have to believe in yourself and be disciplined as well and consistent. So you ran it for five years. And, yes. then, and then what happened? So, no, I've run it all these years, but it transitioned from being a luxury printed uh quarterly publication to of course transitioning into digital of course with Instagram on all of this I got to live all of this uh, so right now we're actually celebrating 11 years in the market but when the pandemic came as we all know we all change in some way or another and we I feel like we all connected to like our true essence what we really love and I connected back to that girl in Colombia who loved literature and poetry and creative writing and I was in a position where I had this platform now and I said 
you know, we're in full lockdown. I started writing myself a lot and I did a contest online through our platform. And this is like when we were all at home and I'm like, okay, I'm gonna do this contest for people to express their feelings, right? Uh, Latin, Latinx poets to send their poems about immigration, what they're feeling, social justice. And I, and I thought, oh my God, here I go with my crazy ideas. Who's gonna care about poetry right now in these times we're living in? And to my surprise, we got almost 200 submissions of incredible writing from all over the U.S., which for the most part, we always been like a West Coast company. And I was getting, I mean, we we're talking young voices from like Brooklyn and Florida and the Midwest and Texas. And I'm like, oh, my God, like who is publishing these incredible, brilliant and very meaningful voices? And the answer is no one, because, you know, in the U.S., there is five big, uh, huge uh, publishing houses, and we're like, Latina, we're like three to 5% of everything that's been published, and that's when the idea came, and the, my company transformed into what we're now, which is Alegria Publishing, so it, it's a beautiful kind of turn of events. But the magazine's still going. Yeah, still years going, running. yeah. Uh, can, you, can you share with people, we, have, we had a couple people on that have created magazine companies, the question I have for you is like, what is the hard part of it? Is it is it getting the advertising revenue, and then and getting that to continue because we're in a world where people are valuing print less. Obviously, you move to digital. Yes. But I think that we can make the same argument where people are probably I don't I don't know this, but people are probably reading digital less than like scrolling on TikTok or Instagram, right, or like watching video content. So 100%. what what was the what's the challenging part, and how have you seen that change in in eleven years, which is when technology has really changed this whole game. Oh, everything has changed and it continues to change and you have to adapt. And I think it comes down to one word that I'm big on and it's creativity, right? I think you have to stay so creative how you adapt and, and transition and go with what's, what people love, right? Without losing the essence. So I can tell you right now, you are correct. You know, we are on these platforms 24-7, you yeah. know, even when we, yeah. we don't want to. So it comes down to a storytelling and to really bringing stories that, really connect with people nowadays. And we see how we all connect with different things now, right? We are moving more into really finding, at least for me, you know, alegria means happiness in Spanish. So at least for me as an entrepreneur even, like I think we're interested in content that is it's kind of moving us more towards like living the life we all want, whatever that looks for you and ad adapting to create content that really resonates with people. When, when you think about, so, in today, so I'm like, I, this is a skill I wish I had, I don't have it. Like, uh -huh. Writing, I am so bad. I've never been good at writing, and like just awful. And it's something I tried to get better at, but I can't. But there's tools today. You know, we have like different tools like Chat GPT. Oh my God, yes. And uh, which and Jasper AI, which we use. How do you view these tools as like an asset in relation to your business? How has it changed, or how does it make you think a little bit differently? Yes, absolutely. I was actually just looking at this challenge where like. With this technology, you can write a book like so quickly. Yeah, so fast. It's like anyone could write a book, right? I can write a book. Like exactly. That's, yeah, that's how like, bad it is. Yeah, yeah. and you know, writer, of course, Jasper you know, yeah. who who am I, you know, to to know what's happening? Because our world is just in ten years, our world is going to be completely different. But I can tell you right now that from the way I view things and the way I live my life, I really value, once again, art, right, and creativity. So I think these tools, of course, can help us with a lot of the processes that are tedious because writing a book, you know, there is the creative aspect and then there is the tedious part of the editing and the production and all these things. And of course, this technology, great, I think is going to cut all that stuff and is maybe going to make it easier. The thing where I'm curious and interested and kind of conflicted too is that where do, you know, that unique output that we have as creatives, you know, comes in. So, so it comes down to this for me. Anybody today, as we know it, could load a Word document into Amazon and write a book, right? Or put it into one of these platforms and call it ebook. And then all of a sudden you're an author. Yeah, and yeah. then you can pay all this money and be like an Amazon bestseller, right? And it's all money and marketing, right? But what kind of writer do you want to be? Is this really your passion? You're doing it for what reason? So it comes down to purpose and what kind of artist you are, right? So there is the 
Van Goghs and there's other types of artists, right? And, and I think there's space for everyone, but I think you have to be honest with yourself. I do value a lot art and I feel the creative process is important. So like for me, I'm always going to stay with being really truthful to your art and to your message. It's important to everything that we do. We actually, our process, we start with our writers because we have a writer collective. We start with people from page one all the way to the distribution of their book. So it, it's a very holistic and hard center approach, yeah. you know, to a creative process. And, and I really love, it's very transformational. It's more than writing a book. It literally changes people's lives. And, and for me, that is my company, oh, okay. but that is not for everybody. And there's different, different reasons that, you sure. know, people write books. Sure. Okay. So, so then you get these 200 submissions and you have the idea to start the publishing company. Well, and we created an ontology with that. Okay. Yes. And it's interesting because at that time, obviously, I'm like, who's going to buy this? I may sell five copies and I don't care. So I put all these beautiful writing into an anthology that became the Latinx Poetry Project. And it has 65 of these poets from all over the United States. And because I was producing it and we were in full lockdown, I'm like, hello, I don't know if I'm going to sell anything. So it's like very like, you know, newspaper print, kind of more like a booklet than a like actual professional book. We have now over 32 titles. That book is the bestseller. Wow. I was packing, I think in the pandemic, over 5,000 copies of that book. Wow. And I was just going to the post office. Nobody was there. And I was just like taking that there. And I was like, it was so, so beautiful. And it just showed me that once again, you know, the power of community. And just like how much untapped talent there is out there. And, and unfortunately, a lot of people don't have um, access, you know, in community of color. And, and I feel like if I had the fortune within my community to already have this platform, like my joy really is to just launch the careers of these artists. And was it all over the country, all over the world that it was selling? And, and do you yes. think it's, and I imagine that these authors were also probably pumping promoting it out, it promoting it also. Yes, and, that and probably it's beautiful. Leads to success. Yeah, but they were not like the beauty of this. There were no influencers. You know yeah, what I mean? There was like people. some of them don't even have an Instagram. Some sure. of them open it just to promote the book. They, I really didn't care, and I still don't care. Like, like some of them have like a hundred followers, but they're brilliant. Yeah. Like they're better than anything you've ever written, like seen uh, on the commercial side of things. You know, and that's the beauty of it. We talked to one author, Britt Frank, who. When she was talking with her publisher, her publisher basically said, like, it doesn't matter what platform you're on. You need to pick a platform and develop a following on there because that's the only way that you're ever really going to get traction as an author. And I was curious if you have any kind of I know you just said, like, it doesn't matter if they have 100 followers or whatever. But are you trying to coach your authors mm -hmm. into how to build a following, how to gain an audience so that they can get more traction? And therefore, like everyone wins. Yeah. So. We do that through our platform. That's kind of like the funnel through what every, everything You're goes through. You're trying to through. do that for them. Exactly. Yeah. Because some of them, quite honestly, they're not even interested. Some of them are students doing their MFA programs or like, so there, some of them are not even interested in that. And as we know, <laughs> social media takes a lot of time. It can, and, yeah. Yes. And yeah. it takes a lot out of your life. But yeah, you know, for those that are open to, we definitely off, open like all those resources. But some people, they're okay. Just being artists. And, and yeah. I respect that as well. Where do you want to take this ultimate? Like how many books do you want to publish a year? What's the, what's sort of the goal? Yes, yeah, so since 2020 up to now, we actually have published more Latina books than any even of the big five publishing companies. And that's incredible. I mean, we, we published 32 titles so far. And that, including our anthologies, is like over 160 Latina writers and poets, which is incredible. And of course, I want to be out there with, with the big ones, right? Making a difference. Um, social impact is definitely something that is on my heart because as a Latina that came here when I was 17 years old with a speaking English and literally doing it all the way through, I really have a soft spot for all the people that come to this country and all that we have to go through to, you know, to make a name for ourselves and yeah. help our families and make a living. So, so my passion really is that grow it as much as I can so I can obviously, you know, 
help as many people as possible fulfill their dreams. And is a TV film also part of this? Like one of these scripts maybe gets picked up or one of the books gets <gasps> written into a series or something like that. Is that something you're working on? Yes, we're actually working on a documentary because okay. I have uh, an initiative that I actually started in, before the pandemic and it's the Allegri of Mobile Bookstore. So I got an old van. I saw uh, that. Yes. Yeah. And really that, cool, by the way. So cool. I got like an old van in the valley for like, $2,500 and I curated it and inside is Instagrammable. So the yeah, idea I within that. this is that people connect, you know, and I introduce them also to like the books I love reading in Colombia, you know, Latin American classics and stuff like that through, you know, a fun, engaging way. And we take these to underserved schools and areas. And this bookstore, I tell you, like it got us on like Oprah Magazine, like it's been one of the most beautiful initiatives I've done. And to this day, actually became part of our nonprofit, which is the Alegria Mobile Bookstore and Arts Collective. And I want to do a documentary about it. So we're actually shooting it. Yeah. yeah. And about the people that, that it impacts and how creative writing really can help people. And like I said, mental health, what I've learned is that, you know, we're in a mental health crisis. There's no surprise to anybody, especially young people. I'm very passionate about helping young people, like help them heal you know through the arts and creative writing does that like a lot of the young writers that I have in our collective I mean some of them before they start they're like considering suicide some of these have very like deep mental health issues obsessed with compulsive disorder depression and when they write their stories when they actually get to express everything even journaling you know you see the healing that takes place. So I am like, I feel like that's the part I'm most passionate about right now because I've seen like the transformation of people in front of my eyes. So So it's almost like it helps them deal with their trauma, whatever it might be. 100%, yes. And it puts them at ease in some way. It's like sharing their story, I guess, puts it, puts them at ease. That's interesting. Yes. When you think about social media today, do you think it, it sort of, like, do you think you can take over the top five somehow by just being better equipped with better tools and and like being faster in a changing environment than them? I don't think so, just because they have so much money (laughs) and capital, you know, and obviously I'm still a small business. So as we know, you know, all these things cost a lot of money. And of course, like, you know, when sometimes they have, you know, some of the like big authors we see on the New York Times bestseller list, which usually are not BIPOC, you know, it's changing slowly. But, you know, these books have... Under them, they have have a million dollars in publicity. So, you know, it's hard to compete with that because we're very grassroots, right? But I do see one of these big five coming up to us or meeting with them and actually creating something together. I think that would be a, a beautiful thing and kind of like being able to use their expertise and, and their resources and me bringing something that I feel so necessary and relevant in today's age. Yeah. And for people that are listening, how can they help you maybe with your nonprofit? What's, is there, do you take donations? How do you get the word out? Do you have a board? Do you have events? Yes. So we do all of that. Mm. Of course, right now we do a lot of the grants, you know, I'm applying for all yeah, these sure. grants in the arts. So absolutely donations would be great. And they can find us through everything that we do at AllegriaMagazine.com, Allegria Publishing. And we do take like the bookstore to different events throughout the year. So National Poetry Month is coming right now. Like April is National Poetry Month. So we're definitely going to be with the bookstore everywhere. And and I'm the person to contact. We're always doing stuff awesome. and partnerships. When does yeah. the documentary, when do you think it'll come out? Probably a year. Yeah? yeah. Yes. And the stories are going to be very, very cool because there is so much talent. If there's one thing to love about LA is the talent that you find. And there is an amazing poetry community in Los Angeles and one of my mentors he is African-American and is the creator of the Sims Library of Poetry in Inglewood and I have to say he's been a big inspiration because if you're talking about creative writing on poetry and spoken word the African-American community are the pioneers they are the ones that literally have taken this art to another level and I'm very fortunate to have Hiram Sims the founder of this library be my mentor as well so there is so much out there and what a beautiful way to like you know for us to be able to see more of this talent when it comes to the way you I guess you view the the media and you know the, the lack of representation because I, I think about it this way. If you focus on that, there's a way of you getting sort of taken away from your talent, right? It's like, just write. Just don't don't worry about that. But is that always something that's top of mind for you? That it's like, we need to get the word out. 
do you know what I'm saying? Like instead of focusing on we're gonna get we're gonna start working with these Latinx people from all over the world and that's the mission and it's just gonna be like great writing from them versus some people want to attack like just representation. Mm. Do you know what I'm saying? And sometimes I think these two things can, they're actually kind of different. Yes, I think sometimes we get also trapped too much in kind of what we want the world to be, right? That utopia, which, hello, I'm the most idealistic person you'll ever meet. But for me, it's all about action. And the only way I can, I mean, I can debate and protest all I want. And yes, I will when I'm invited to panels and I'm always speaking, you know, advocating for our culture. But the way for me that I can do my part is through action. And action is doing this work every day to make sure that more of us are out there and that this work is out there and that people see that we're, you know, we're not what we're put out to be, you know. So I I think comes from just doing your part, you know, action. Sometimes now we get too much caught up in opinions, you know. Yeah. And at the end of the day, I think that's just making the difference is the action. That's what I I totally agree. As a developer, Mm -hmm. I feel the same way. There's not many Latino developers. Here I am. It's easy. The podcast, same thing. And it's just like, that's it. That's it's just that's it. And if people want like they they can assign value to it the way they want. Right. And so if you're a. Latin America and you see me doing this oh that's cool I, I look like him and if you're not it doesn't really matter it's the same thing it's like oh that's cool that's kind of how I look at it absolutely we yeah. can all just do the best we can with what we're given you know and as long as you're doing that that's the best well look how can people support where can they buy the books Anywhere books are sold, you know, Amazon, Barnes & Noble online, Target online. And of course, you know, I also, if you go to Alegria Publishing on Instagram, we're very active on Instagram. So if you go to the platform on IG, it definitely takes you to our shop and also to connect with all these creators directly because it's important too. I love to, you know, for most people, they're probably aware of this, but you know, when you support a creator directly, it's obviously better for them than when you go through another of these big platforms because, you know, there's big yeah, commissions. There's commissions and, there, yeah, yeah, exactly. Fees. So always, you know, in general, I think when we're helping independent artists, no matter where they come from, I think if we go to the source, I think it's always better for them. Well, with that in mind, when you set up Alegria Publishing, how did you determine your revenue model? Did you take some inspiration from the big five or did you try and rewrite it completely so that the artists could better benefit yes so it was very important for me that they benefit more than you know the traditional model so there are things as a publisher that you cannot change because that's the way it is in the publishing industry like the big amazons of the world they just have a model and me as a publisher I'm not able to control what they take from us. In that way, in those models, I'm not able to change anything. But what I can change is what I do with them directly. So most publishers across the line would do 10 to 15%. To the author, I do 50-50. So yeah, so that's the way, yes. So that's the way I do it myself. And I think it's, you know, good. That's amazing. Yes. Wow. And that's the part I can control, so. 50-50. 50 50 Get on the platform that's incredible right. yes well look this is one of our first podcasts with these wonderful chairs if anyone's ever looking for a book to read or a chair to read in sunday great furniture. reading chair very nice i like it approve <laughs> approve <laughs> <laughs> the last ones were plastic and they would shake all over they weren't very yeah. good they were kind of the, like, these are so much these nicer are much better. they actually have cushion the other ones did not no this is awesome and your space is beautiful thank you thank you so much this is wonderful thanks for coming on the podcast yeah, i really no, appreciate it thank you thank you so much if you made it this far i bet you loved the episode so you should join our youtube channel membership for only 2.99 a month this gets you access to one the whole unabridged conversation two you get the episodes on monday one day earlier three you get two additional entries to our giveaways check out our instagram to see what we've given away and four you get access to seasons one through three that's over a hundred episodes of wisdom and life-changing advice what are you waiting for join